Bon dia. Bon dia. Hello, Argan. People, people are saying hello. Very nice. To the speaker. <laughs> so good morning to everyone. I think that we are already about 100 participants. I think that we, we, we can start the, the session. Uh, welcome to this uh, I see in Tuesday at home uh, webinar. Uh, I think it's the third webinar that I see in Tuesday organizing uh, since this uh, COVID era time. And I'm really happy to see that we are quite successful on, on attracting the interest of uh, many scientists. So today we have uh, Peter Bogging with us. It's a real pleasure for us to, to, to have him here. Uh, Peter is a, is a full professor and he's a leader of the nanocarbon group at the Technical University of Denmark, BTU. He's, he's also a member of the Center of Excellence uh, on Nanostructurography, a very focused Center of Excellence there. Uh, and he's been involved in many other activities uh, related to, to graphene and 2D materials, the, the topic that he will be talking about uh, today. He's, of course, a member of the, of the graphene flagship. Uh, he's, he's involved in three work packages. He's a task leader there. And he's also involved in initiatives such as uh, this Danish alliance between industry and, and, and uh, research centers on pushing graphene technology uh, to, to industry. So uh, with this, I think that you can imagine that his research interest in the past years is, is graphene and 2D materials. He's been involved from, it's quite transversal in the sense that he's involved from the synthesis to the transfer and ad advanced characterization and finally to, to device fabrication working with electronics and, and sensing devices also. Uh, he's been writing more than 200 papers, around 200 papers and, and 10 patents, most of them on, on graphene and related materials. So I think that uh, you can imagine that all the scientific work of Peter now is around in this 2D uh, uh, world uh, of Underwald's uh, materials. Uh, so um, I have to say, that well, I was I, I forgot to say also that he's involved in one other initiative related to graphene, which is the annual conference uh, called Carbon Hagen, and I want to, to say that because uh, it's it's now running in a different format. Now it's called Carbon Line Hagen, and uh, it's funny because yesterday, uh, I mean, there was a very uh, an excellent talk given by by Frank Coppens, and uh, he was chairing the session, and I was at, at the audience, and today we are able. Uh, to, to bring him to I think too, and I, I, I can be chairing his session. So uh, I think that this, this, this uh, sad, dark times has also some positive uh, things, uh, some possibilities. So uh, Peter will be talking about uh, graphene at the edge, about how to do band uh, engineering uh, uh, and the chemistry of graphene at the edge. And I think that uh, with this, I can just give the word to Peter. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, that was, uh, uh, it's great to be here. I don't exactly know where here is. Uh, I, th I feel I'm, I'm with you. Uh, so uh, perhaps uh, this, is, uh, this is working. So I, what I will do now is uh, get started and sharing my screen, see if I can do that. Is this visible for you, all of you? Oh, Peter. Yeah. Peter, let me interrupt you. I, I forgot one very important thing. No problem. I, I, I forgot to, to explain something about the, the, the way the questions will be managed. Sure. Sorry, this is the, my first webinar. <laughs> so uh, the, the, we will manage the questions. So I suggest all this, uh, the, the participants of the audience to just write the questions uh, as they come out to you yeah, in real time. And, and you have to do that in the question and answer um, uh, option that you have at the bottom, so near the chat. So we are not going to use the chat, but the question and answer option. And I will be just <coughs> gathering all the questions and answers. Uh, and instead of just uh, waiting until the end of the talk, we decided, since Peter will be talking about three different topics, subtopics, we decided to stop at uh, each one so that we could uh, address the, the questions and answers uh, of each subtopic. Okay? So it will be like a three chapter uh, talk. And um, so we will be able to select some of the questions uh, like we, we won't have time, I hope, because there will be many questions to, to deal with all of them, uh, but uh, we'll be able to, to have some questions uh, answered in real time there. Okay, so with this explanation, I think that you can start, Peter. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I would like to, I, what I hope happens is that these three chapters uh, form a, a sort of a continuous story, at least that's the intention. And I'm going to talk about graphene and particularly the edges of graphene, uh, the disorder, chemistry, uh, a bit of that, and also hopefully end up uh, in time with speaking about some recent work we did where we, uh, for the first time, did the uh, band gap and band structure engineering in the graphene. Uh, so, let's, so first off, uh, I am from the Center for Nanostructural Graphene, at the, mainly at the Physics Department at the Technical University of Denmark. And in this talk particularly, some of these people here are the ones that have been most involved. And here it is particularly Bjarke Jesen, Lene Gammelgaard and Jose Caridad, who have uh, been, uh, been leading the, uh, the activities and the research I'm going to talk about. Uh, I should also mention, uh, mention Mads Brandby, who uh, is a theorist who has pulled a big load in, uh, in trying to understand these, uh, these experiments, and the same thing with Morten Thompson and Thomas Pedersen from Aalborg University. So we live here at, uh, at, uh, next to the clean room, uh, where we are happy customers, and uh, this is a, a view, I think it's a few years old, but I like it very much. You can see uh, Professor Antje Pekajau in the center, he's a center leader, happy guy with his family. But uh, let's uh, move on to the problem of patterning. And uh, I will try to motivate why we are obsessed with patterning. It seems like why, you know, maybe a lot of the research, exciting, extremely cool research is done today where the graphene is just cut into uh, fairly large uh, devices, but we are interested in, interested in patterning graphene on a very fine scale. So if you look at a piece of graphite and you, uh, Tilt it a bit, you can see the topmost layer of graphene, and then with a, maybe some tape and some lock, you manage to separate the graphene sheet from the graphite stack. And uh, you, then you note that there are actually two things that you could call surfaces. So the surface of graphene for most people is the basal plane, which to a uh, solid state physicist maybe is more like uh, the bulk. Uh, because for a 2D material, the true surface is the edge. However, it's uh, fair to acknowledge that for these 2D materials, the fact that every bulk atom is accessible to us to image, to view, to functionalize, to remove, to replace, gives us an, a fantastic opportunity for engineering these materials that simply doesn't exist for three-dimensional materials. Yes, you can make alloy, but this one-by-one -one control of uh, the position and the and you know, the structure of, of the basal, like the bulk uh, atoms in a crystal is a completely new thing. Well, it's not completely new because we've had these opportunities for 15 years. And quite soon after uh, the, uh, these first papers uh, came out in around 2004, uh, uh, then people start speculating about things like nano ribbon, nano constrictions, like what happens if we, um, cut this fantastic material into smaller pieces. It must be even better. Actually, that was not the case. The thing is that what happens at the edge is interacting with the, uh, with the, um, the electron uh, basal, I mean, the electrons that move around here on the, on, the, on the basal plane. And what happens at the edges is, is, is quite closely linked in a way that makes it very, very hard to make small structures in graphene that works. So this is our obsession. We want to make circuits. We want to make meta materials. We want to alter the current pathways, but also the properties of 2D materials using patterning and using modulation of the, you could say a modulation of the crystal. And a crystal is an infinite periodic arrangement. Uh, and we are disrupting this infinite periodic arrangement in order to achieve an uh, you could say an edge. So we want to make circuits and components by cutting out the graphene in specific shapes, but also in engineering what you could call meter materials, uh, where the, uh, we essentially redefine the, the properties of the, of the charge carriers uh, so that they behave in a fundamentally different way. And then this thing happens, because whenever we try to, try to carve graphene, we, we, spit, we are asking for trouble. So as it turns out, graphene is a ballistic material, so the electrons move very easily. And that means that, that, that graphene is a kind of a non-local material. That means that uh, uh, conductivity is not defined as an intrinsic, like you cannot point anywhere 
uh, in graphene and say the conductivity is some value here, you know, it's a ballistic material. So that means that what happens in a, in, in principle far away can, can matter in different type, different areas of the, of the device. So even tiny uh, disorder and, uh, and what happens at the edges can have a huge impact on, on the transport properties. And this is a, was an unpleasant surprise. And it has to do with, uh, you could say that God made the bulk, the surface was invented by the devil, which is uh, supposed to be a site from Wolfgang Pauli. And since graphene is 100% surface, in a way it's not so strange that we are, uh, we are having a difficult time. And you can also wonder if, this, if the surface was invented by the devil, so who invented graphene? Uh, okay. So just to remind you what uh, we, uh, the, the word quasi particle means. So it's a, a way to speak of a complicated many body problem, sort of an electron wave moving in a, in a complex arrangement of ions uh, and that are arranged in a specific geometric way. Uh, that is extremely difficult problem to solve, but fortunately nature has given us the possibility to, to introduce uh, quasi particles. So electrons and holes are just examples of the quasi particles in a semiconductor that helps us to uh, work with, uh, with electronics and uh, photonics in a way that is far easier than when we have to deal with the full, uh, the full complexity of the many body problem. So here we are just saying, all right, so an electron wave moving uh, in, the, in a gallium arsenide crystal here, okay, looks pretty complicated with the, uh, the band structure, but just right here where the valence band and the conduction may need, we can introduce some effective masses and then just pretend that these are weakly interacting particles. So that's a, as, a, as a completely essential concept in solid state physics, without which we wouldn't have a chance to, uh, <laughs> to do anything. So in graphene, it's a bit different because of the particular arrangement uh, we end up with a band structure that is just different from, uh, from uh, what we're used to in semiconductors. Here we have the linear dispersion, uh, linear relation between energy and momentum at these uh, six uh, uh, K points. And the, uh, that gives rise to this uh, photon-like uh, linear dispersion where you have the velocity, the Fermi velocity, and the momentum uh, multiplied gives you the Fermi energy. And this is resembling a bit the uh, the situation for photons. We also have this sort of a kind of a speed of light for these direct fermions, which is 300 times smaller than the speed of light for photons, like the real speed of light. And here I would like to just uh, briefly flash a recent result, we uh, recent work we did, because uh, while we this value of 300 times smaller than the speed of light is often quoted, it actually depends a lot on the substrate. So I just want to remind you, because not too many people are talking about this, that depending on what substrate you put your graphene on, you have, can have a completely different um, Fermi velocity. And since the mobility depends on the Fermi velocity uh, to the power of two, that can have a big impact on the mobility. Uh, so we used the terahertz uh, radiation uh, to measure the conductivity and the carrier density and mobility of graphene. So this is something we've worked on for uh, almost a decade now. Uh, and I think we recently produced the first map of the Fermi velocity that has been recorded here on CBD graphene. Unfortunately, it's a bit boring because it actually looks like it's not varying that much. But the take home message is that the so-called uh, constant uh, Fermi velocity uh, has some pretty big swings that depends on the carrier density and the, and the substrate. Uh, so now you know, if you didn't know already. Let me get back to the main story, why we are patterning graphene. Uh, so first off, uh, see, I will just remove this so we can see what the actually is supposed to be on the slide. All right. Okay, that's better. So back in 2008, uh, Antje Peri Jauho and Thomas Pedersen, who are now in the, our research center, they uh, noted that when you are, if you pattern graphene on a small scale uh, with a periodic arrangement of holes, you can open a band gap that depends on the geometry here. And um, well, <laughs> he, I remember Antti showed me this picture and said, can you do this? And I thought, yeah, it looks a bit small, but actually not a bit small because on these first calculations, the, you know, the distance between the holes is a few nanometer, which is impossible to do with top-down lithography. But uh, they kept on, the theorists kept on suggesting all kinds of wonderful things that would happen if we did it 
you know, so we just got started and have spent like 10 years trying to do this, trying to punch holes in graphene in a way that just vaguely resemble the perfection that we see here. So all of these wonderful things that you see, they're way ahead of us and most of these papers are old. So the theorists have, are way ahead of us in terms of asking for things that they want us to make and we have taken a long time for working out how to do it. So uh, also should, I should mention that there's another approach that actually delivers exactly this type of resolution where you can make a nanoporous graphene. It is Aitan uh, uh, who is uh, hosting this and, uh, and uh, Cesar Moreno and others who uh, uh, managed to, uh, uh, two years ago, to make this fantastic paper here. So I'm just, I'm not gonna talk about this because uh, we are, want to be able to make specific patterns where we are like draw whatever structure we want, but I have to say this is a fantastic material we're also very interested in. So we would like to do things like this, like electron waveguides, uh, this is uh, from a paper uh, uh, we, we published uh, years back, where uh, by changing the arrangement locally, uh, we can guide the current in a uh, in specific way, make valley filters and all sorts of crazy things. So with continuous patterns, we uh, hope to make new materials by varying the patterns locally, we can make new components and circuits. That's what we want to do. Here comes the problem of edge disorder. And uh, so in this classic nanoconstriction experiment, the blue area here is a two-dimensional electron gas and it's a semiconducting material. So you have squeezed out the carriers below these electrostatic gates. And in this classic experiment, we have this uh, conductance, uh, conductance staircase, so quantized conductance as we change the the gate voltage, we are kind of squeezing the, uh, the electron gas more and more. And, and you can see that uh, we are having an, an integer number of quantum channels that are uh, carrying the current through this constriction. But when you try to do this with graphene, you should think graphene is a superior material, but it's just horrible. It's so hard. And the thing is that in, in, instead of this soft electrostatic potential we have due to the gates, now we're just cutting with our scissors. We are removing atoms. And we don't have this soft potential. We have a hard potential where the disorder is in direct uh, contact with electron gas. And that makes uh, the measurements look like this instead. So the, the, the nice and, and clean uh, conduction staircase is extremely difficult to achieve with, with graphene. So there you already are, are, are smelling where I'm going because this is about uh, the fact that graphene edge disorders of, is, a, is, a, is a real issue. And uh, this was already uh, studied and talked about and, and mentioned in papers like 10 years back by Christoph Stampfer and also I think this is uh, Philip Kim's group and others have, have pointed out that when you do this kind of carving out graphene, instead of the nice um, electron waveguide that you hope to get analogies uh, to the, uh, to the fibers, uh, glass fibers for optical waveguides, you get this kind of bumpy potential where the electrons literally have to tunnel or jump from island to island to reach from source to drain. As it happens, it has some signatures that resemble a bit a band gap, but this is not a band gap, this is just bad graphene. You know, bad graphene that where you, there's nothing like an electron wave guide. And this was pointed out already 10 years ago. But perhaps we were too stubborn or or uh, ignorant to, uh, to realize that it was hopeless. So we just plowed on and um, we have done so many things. So this is one of the more fun things I'd like to show you because it's really interesting. Uh, so it's uh, inspired by this, uh, this quote from Gaiman Novoselov, unless a technique for anisotropic etching of graphene is found, random edges may lead to additional scattering, which is just what I'm talking about, which can cancel all the advantages offered by graphene's ballistic transport. In my view, this is spot on. And what we did, so, so we realized that we have to find a way to make nature help us so that we can get uh, clean edges. So we started to think about experiments in TEM. This is mainly Tim Booth and Joachim Thompson who, uh, and, and others of Tim's uh, guys who has worked on this. So with sophisticated holders, we can heat up graphene inside a transmission electron microscope and uh, by tuning the, uh, the etching uh, parameters like the presence of oxygen and the heat and things like that, we, uh, we were, you see, the edge is almost around, almost flat, but it's always some roughness. So even here, it's very difficult to kind of achieve, I don't know what you can see. I hope the, trans the internet is good enough to show you this movie, but the edge roughness doesn't go to 
zero. It's still like a nanometer. So even this is, this is experiment, we also tried with silver particles, like small Pac-Man, to etch the graphene sheet. So this is also a, a live movie in a transmission electron microscope. So you can see it's cutting along the zigzag edges and it's sort of almost okay. But when you have a closer inspection, this earth, the edge roughness is still around a nanometer. And we really hope we could get it to zero. But of course, methods like these are, are interesting from a scientific point of view, but we were not able to transfer these to a large scale on, and make devices as such. So after trying this and a lot of other types of nanolithographies, we went back to the trusted workhorse of nano uh, technology, which is electron beam lithography. So top, good old fashioned top down electron beam lithography turns out to be what we have uh, worked most on after trying many, many different things. So this is a structure just like the one I showed before, where you have a graphene constriction with gold electrodes and this stuff is just silicon dioxide. And the width is 100 nanometer. And uh, when you look at edge roughness, you see that we actually here with traditional etching methods, we have achieved something that is comparable to the anisotropic etching we saw before, around a nanometer. That seems to be the best we can do. So with a normal etching, and when I say normal, it's using a, a plasma ash, an oxygen plasma, you, you get three to five nanometer. So this is a carefully tuned reactive ion etching that took some time to get right. And when you, when you do that, you can get decent edges. So just to show you the difference, so this is the uh, three, this is a kind of edge roughness in a, this is to scale. So you can imagine this is a graphene channel and I've just, you know, just so you can see how it's not like, it's, it seems to be that there's lots of room in, in, in this channel for the electron waves to move, but even the roughness here is enough to uh, strongly disrupt the, uh, the transport here, it appears like. So edge roughness seems to be very important. And let's just, let me show you some measurements. So this is done with an, uh, an oxygen plasma, and we have this edge, estimated edge roughness of three to five nanometer, where the transmission is 30% of the theoretical maximum, which is when we have a fully ballistic channel. So you calculate with this uh, Sharvin relation here. And when you go to a smooth channel, you, uh, where you have the one nanometer roughness, we almost hit 100%. So it's it, tiny difference at the edges, even a very wide channel seems to have a big difference. Uh, and one of the things that we discovered uh, was that when you look at the electrostatics, so this is the ribbon seen from the front, and this is the back gate, and these are the field lines, then the, the, there is a charge accumulation, like you can think of it as a capacitive fringe effect, that happens at the edges, and that turns out to be very sensitive to the edge roughness. So these are calculations. Uh, so if you have a bit of edge roughness, the charge accumulation is not so strong. And it, the, the big surprise for us was that we looked at the quantum Hall effect in these devices. It turns out that when you have a very sharp, very cool, smooth edge, the quantum Hall effect breaks down. So this is opposite as we thought it would happen. But it, ha it turns out that this charge accumulation in the edge is creating this sort of uh, spikes in the local density of states. And this in turn uh, undermines the uh, quantum Hall effect. So we, uh, you can read more about this, conduction, quantization suppression in the quantum Hall regime, where we find out that when you have smooth edges, there's a strong charge accumulation at the edges and this uh, changes the uh, the potential enough to uh, disrupt the quantum Hall effect, which otherwise at high magnetic fields is uh, very robust in, in these devices. So the bottom line of all this is that if, if edge disorder on the scale of a few nanometers can, can impact 100 nanometer wide graphene, how about 10 nanometer graphene? Because that's where we want to go if we really want to change the properties of graphene. So at this point, we should probably have given up and say, okay, so if we, if we, if we see this type of impact on 100 nanometer, how, how can we continue? So if there are any questions here, uh, so I can take these. Um, yeah. Aita, do I press answer live or what? I, th I think that I can I can just uh, uh, I can, tell I, can the, just, I can tell you the questions and then you can just I can I can read them here. Are you you're reading them? Okay. So the first is from uh, Juan, who's asking: Have you measured Fermi velocity in suspended graphene? If so, what value did you measure? Um, we did not. 
uh, in suspended uh, graphene. I mean, you should measure. Um, you should measure. Uh, I said 0.8 times times 10 to the six meters per second. I can't remember the value, but that's sort of the the value that corresponds to uh, permittivity, like a relative uh, dielectric constant of one. Um, so we did not do that. Um, since we use, yeah, so that's we, with the method we're using here, we can't do it because we're using terahertz radiation to, 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 to do the measurement. The, well, normally when you are measuring the mobility in, in a normal field effect device, the, uh, you don't, you cannot extract the Fermi velocity. It's because the, the, uh, how we extract the mobility for the terahertz radiation is a bit different. So there you actually see discrepancy if you don't insert the right Fermi velocity. We have to put in the Fermi velocity in to, to, to ex extract the results there. You don't have to do that whether you do, if you do a hole or, or a field effect mobility measurement. So, so the, terahertz, but the terahertz measurement cannot be done on a suspended graphene right now because we cannot make big enough pieces of suspended graphene. Uh, the spot size for the terahertz radiation is 300 micrometer. What are the most common approaches for integration of graphene in solid state devices? Did anyone ever fabricate graphene based membranes? Yes, that's uh, actually uh, we are working right now. Oh, so Alex, uh, Alex, you want to answer this? I don't, or should I, I don't know. But sure, graphene based membranes is, a, is a, for, for a number of different, uh, for pressure sensors, uh, something we are very interested in. We have a, Hope to collaborate with the Aravin via Aravin from the uh, University of uh, of Manchester on this, and also people are using membranes for all sorts of other things, uh, for mass sensing and so on. Christian Schaefer, have, how do you know that the transport is really deteriorated by the edge roughness and not by other interactions of the two D bulk with the substrate roughness impurities from fabrication, etc. Uh, you're right. I mean, we don't know that for sure. Um, we have a, there's a lot of literature on it that, uh, in, but, uh, but how to know precisely when you're making any change of the, um, when you're making any change of the fabrication procedure, even no matter how much, how careful you are, you cannot exclude that there's some, something else going on. It's, it's very complicated. So of course we try to do the, the comparative measurements between the rough and the clean samples as much as possible uh, using everything uh, identical except for the etching process itself. Uh, but etching processes are also different and can leave different types of etch termination on the edges. So, um, so you're right, it's probably uh, more, I would say, I wouldn't call it evidence, but maybe strong indication. So that's a good point. Um, have you considered strain effects beside local defects? Um, we haven't, no. I, that's a good point. We haven't uh, discussed that. So, should, uh, probably we should continue. I have, uh, I have a question myself. Since sure. I have, uh, and there is another one coming up now. So, there's one from Miguel Pruneda. So, maybe you so, can address that. Yeah, uh, so that's a... An excellent question. We would really like to, to take all of this to TMDs, for instance. My, I anticipate that the lower mean free path means that the, um, you, know, you have a diffusive, uh, in a diffusive uh, device, the edges don't matter. So it's mainly for high quality devices where you are in the quasi-ballistic or ballistic regime, where you would expect that you have this sort of long range effect of edge disorder. The substrate that you would expect the best mobility is uh, uh, hexagonal boron nitride. With, with the, at least that's what I think. However, um, uh, Christoph Stampfer from uh, Aachen University has, has very recently demonstrated uh, that uh, you, can, you can achieve uh, uh, mobilities that are even higher than intrinsic limit in graphene by using a, um, a certain TMD, I think it's tungsten disilinide, uh, but I'm not sure. So, so I would say the, the, the usual answer is HBN, hexagonal boron nitride. I'll come, I will actually come back to that, uh, but uh, maybe uh, it can be done better. 
how wide should be the constriction in order to disregard the edge? Uh, I am actually surprised that, so I would say as if you are a few times, if it's a few times larger than the mean free path, with the mean free path is about 100 nanometer in our devices, and that's kind of a comparable to the size of the constriction. So my guess is that once you have a, a constriction that is maybe twice the mean free path, so that means for higher mobility samples, you need a wider um, device. But I, I will show later that, that even for high quality graphene, there is uh, yes, things you can do. Okay, Peter, uh, th there is one question also from Alexandro, uh, Alessandros, which is about the, which is the best sub substrate you could expect the best mobility. Yeah, that was uh, exactly you, you that, right? Okay, yeah. Okay, so let me finish with one more uh, and, and then I think that we, we should go on. I, I have a curiosity myself uh, to know how do you define the edges in these uh, waveguides that you, you were patterning. So when you have a natural edge, that's okay, but how, how is uh, the definition of the edge when you have this pattern uh, uh, graphene where, where you have a wave? Uh, so you, you have an area without any pattern and then you just made the graphene semiconductor at the edges, I guess. By uh, I don't think I understand. So, so how I know where, where the edges are or? Yeah, how do you define edges there? Are they, uh, so is, the, is it so critical, the irregularity there as in natural edges? Because I think that there you have a frontier between semiconducting graphene and a metallic graphene. That's what I understood, right? That's how, that's how you make this, this waveguide by defining semiconductor so, graphene. So I wouldn't call this, this is, this is I, would, I, will be dare, I will not dare to call this a waveguard. I think it's approximating a waveguard. And if you're asking about natural edges versus uh, pattern, lithographic pattern edges, we actually also looked at that. Mm -hmm. And we can see that the, uh, I have some, maybe we can look at the results later, but uh, we used a Kelvin probe force microscopy to examine the charge accumulation in Natural edge, naturally cleaved edges should have zero disorder. Uh, it's hard to, you know, at least that's uh, what uh, you can see in transmission electron microscope, but at least it's close to zero disorder. So if you cleave graphene, that's maybe the only way you can be sure to have a very low disorder. And there we can see that the charge, um, distrib the charge accumulation is, is larger than, uh, than, than pattern. Uh, so we actually did measure this effect that you have this charge accumulation. So even when yeah, okay, so, so I think actually maybe some of these questions will be answered later. Mm -hmm. And also functionalization, I think I would like to continue because I think that's... Okay. And I can see time is flying because I'm having so much fun. I really like this topic, so, uh, <laughs> and that means slows me down. So uh, but that's an advantage. I have two stories left, and I think the next one I will go a bit quick because the last one is, is, is really what I want to talk about. Okay. So, so I will give you the kind of the problem of edge chemistry. Um, and I will uh, try to give you an idea about what it is that we did. Uh, so the thing is that, um, yeah, I can't find the reference to this wonderful figure here, but graphene is not alone. And if we uh, take the, uh, you know, look for uh, some of the 2000 friends and try to find some help, often uh, some problems can be solved. Uh, so we uh, noted, uh, uh, we, all, we have discussed it, we were discussing, we, why don't we try to put graphene in HPN and then pattern it? And then while we were discussing it, uh, we noted that <laughs> then this paper came out, uh, which is a great paper from Jonathan Eroms and also another paper from Christoph Stamfer, showing that it helps a lot. So the idea is, first you make your sandwich, you protect the graphene with the best protection you can get, and then when you have done that, then you start to carve then you are minimizing many of the detrimental effects from the patterning. And that's uh, shown that here you can have uh, ballistic uh, cyclotron orbits even between these pattern holes here, so that the graphene that is in between the patterns are much more unharmed if you do it the pattern through BN. So please, if you want to have patterning with no problems, encapsulation in something, a good encapsulator like HBN, and then you can do the patterning. So uh, we use this uh, method that we uh, is a is a kind of a is building on work by James Holm, and you can start put the graphene inside a stack by repeatedly picking up a crystal and stamping it down on others, and you just 
build up the sandwich from, from below. Every time you want to make a, a bigger sandwich, you just pick up the crystal and go to the next, pick it up and so on. In this case, we just want to have graphene sandwich between two sheets of boron nitride. And uh, this is something you can uh, read about in this paper here. I think that the references will be made available somehow. Uh, but the idea is that when you look at the graphene on the silicon dioxide, uh, then uh, we, we know that the scattering time, which is determining the, the mobility, is, if, is, can be estimated by this Matheson's rule. Uh, so there's intrinsic phonon scattering and there's charge impurities. It could be traps in the silicon dioxide or stuff that lies on top that has a finite charge. There are substrate, for substrate phonons, which are particularly severe for silicon dioxide. Corrugations means that if the substrate is not super flat, that also creates scattering. And then, of course, defects and edges. Maybe you have some, if it's a chemical vapor deposited graphene, you maybe have some defects. And the edges, as we just saw, also introduce some scattering. So the total scattering time, which ultimately determines mobility, is affected by all these. And when you encapsulate the graphene in the boron nitride, you, you, uh, if it's a boron nitride that's high quality, you eliminate the charge impurities. You eliminate the substrate phonons because the uh, electron phonon scattering from graphene to HBN is much, much weaker than from graphene to silicon dioxide. And HBN is atomically flat, so you don't have corrugations either. You still have defects and edges, especially these edges. And the intrinsic phonons are difficult to do something about. So, this is what we're going to do. And you also, you, the typical thing is that the mean free pass is increased from something of the order of 30 to 50 nanometer to something of the order of 1,000 to 2,000 nanometer. So it's a great improvement in the quality by doing that. So the edge is still, you know, this is, you know, nothing can go through the HBN uh, 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 by ordinary diffusion, but the edge is still accessible. And that's what we are going to talk about for a moment here. So when we do this kind of measurement where we are sweeping the gate voltage and measuring resistance, we see this familiar curve here. And what we're doing is we are measuring from negative to positive and from positive to negative. So both the forward sweep and the back sweep. And with this device, as expected in dry air, we don't see anything. This is normal, known that we have no hysteresis or low hysteresis when you are encapsulating graphene in HBN. However, when we introduce a little bit of water, just 1%, we get a very surprising result because now we have a big hysteresis and it's completely symmetric. This is not so common, but it's very symmetric. It really looks like it's offset by the same effect or the same uh, magnitude, which is quite a bit. It's a, it's a pretty big voltage here. And that was introducing a little bit of water. And since the water cannot go through the HBN, we started to think it, we couldn't understand it, but we thought maybe it sits at the edges. Um, and then uh, we looked at, okay, uh, how does the water affect the electron system? Could it be doping? And then we found out that uh, the effect scales with the dipole moment of the molecule. So if the NH3 or NO2, which have a different dipole moment, so it's uh, 1.85 uh, Debye, uh, 1.74 Debye and 0.4 Debye, the uh, hysteresis effect scales with that. So it doesn't seem to be doping. And also we could uh, calculate that the doping from these few water molecules sitting in the edge is not enough to create this massive hysteresis effect. So we had to conclude, it had to do with the dipole moment and started to think, all right, so what if the dipoles are flipping as a response to the gate voltage? So by having a positive gate voltage, they flip one way and a negative uh, voltage, they flip the other way. So, uh, so we examined how likely it is for these uh, for water molecules to attach to uh, the uh, the edges, which we which is usually uh, oxygen or fluorine, depending on the edge. And it turns out that when we have oxygen terminating the graphene sheet, uh, it's it's a big hysteresis, and when it's fluorine, it's a small hysteresis. And when we calculate the binding energies for different molecules, we see that water uh, sticks well on oxygen. Uh, also, the other molecules, they stick well on oxygen, but on fluorine, the binding energy is very low. So that is sort of agreeing with the, the situation that the, the, the fluorine termination is like Teflon. It, it, the water cannot stick very long, and this dipole effect is, is broken down. So everything seems to point in the direction of the ridiculous idea of water dipoles attaching to the edge 
and in that way, it's changing, uh, affecting the electron system. And people suggested, what about, could it be water on top? But the water molecule is a tiny dipole, right? And the dipole field falls off as one of uh, distance to the three. And this is a drawing to scale, 17 layers of boron nitride, no, 50 layers of boron nitride, 17 nanometer tall. And this tiny dipole here, it's just, I haven't done the calculation, but seriously, I don't see how this dipole can, can affect the electron system down here so dramatically. Or if that was the case, the you know graphing devices wouldn't work. We would never be able to keep up the effects of of, uh, of, uh, of contaminants and dipoles. So surface water is out of the question, and we are left with the explanation that it's uh, water sitting at the edge. We also noted that the effect is persistent, like a memory effect. So when we have flipped all these water dipoles, which is also uh, you know we try to. Uh, or come up with a theoretical explanation for this, uh, and everything seemed to fit the explanation. Uh, and one of them was that once you have this situation where the water dipoles are pointing in the same direction, it's sort of um, a quasi-stable, uh, or meta-stable. So, so unless you change the gate voltage to the negative polarity, it stays like that. And that means that we can, we can once we have uh, put the system in this state, this, this one of the bistable state, then you can uh, write and read, you can read the, uh, this uh, peak here multiple times. You go to a negative voltage, you can do the same thing. So we also found out that this, uh, like uh, that, that this, the devices are more or less a uh, textbook, a mem register, um, a mem capacitor uh, behavior here. So this is the, the picture we have and wrote so far, we haven't been able to make an experiment that challenges this explanation. And so therefore, uh, what we have to conclude here is that we have this sort of uh, dip flipping switch, like a ferroelectric molecular switch, where the water molecules are uh, creating a permanent, uh, like a, a persistent uh, hysteresis effect that <laughs> uh, in, depending on the edge termination. And the, edge, and the funny thing is, why hasn't this been seen before? Because most groups, they use a fluorine-based edge to cut out the uh, to cut out the device. And it was more or less an accident that we tried with an oxygen. So the thing is that the edge that you uh, use to cut the graphene is, is have a high probability of leaving uh, either oxygen or fluorine uh, at the edge. And that's what makes a difference. So just just happened that people have used a fluorine based edge, which means that the water molecules don't attach. But if you do something with your fabrication process, so you have a different atom there, then you, you have a hysteresis effect. Of course, we're trying to use this for polar molecule sensors and uh, memory capacitors. We think of this as not as a bug, but as a feature. But for the purpose of patterning graphene in a deterministic way, it's a problem. So edge chemistry and absorbance can cause significant changes in charge in carrier distribution and device behavior, even for encapsulated devices. So we can have, so I have to ask Eiter because I can see the time is uh, really, uh, Escalating here. So what? Because we, we, I mean, there are three questions that, that I can right. address. So uh, how thick does the HPN uh, be to be to disregard corrugation and uh, substrate effects? Disregard well. We we consider HPN of five nanometer or more to be, I would say, a trustworthy mechanical supports. When you go to a few nanometer, they start to be more flexible and, and there's a transition from five nanometer down to a few layers where the HPN starts to follow the corrugations on the surface. But it's, it's a good question. I don't, I can't give you a more defined, well-defined answer. Edge termination is controlled by the etching process that we use to carve out the graphene. As I said, uh, how do you make sure there's no water absorption in the middle of the sandwich during transfer? Uh, we can't. We can't make sure, we try of course, but the, what we are observing is that when we remove the water, the effect is gone. So we believe that if the water was sitting at the interface, it would, uh, we, what, whatever you do outside wouldn't matter because the, that would be stuck and, and would not be able to move out. And, you know, so, so we are pretty sure about that. Uh, okay, so have you tested the situation event from using the fluorine based etching to define the graphene? No, there's a question from, Just, uh, from Justin. Have you tested the hysteresis effect from using the fluorine-based etching to define the graphene if termination on the graphene edges? 
when fluorine containing molecules are present? Uh, no, we haven't done that. We would love to, uh, we have so many good ideas for continuation of this. We hope to get an opportunity to, to answer all of this, these, all these questions in, with experiments, but we haven't tried that. So, Aita, I have to ask yeah. for permission to speak for 15 minutes. Do you think that would work? Yes, yeah, I think we should. Okay, because because this is really, really, really uh, the apex of the talk. <laughs> uh, so the, I would I, like to I round off. I like to round off with the, the recent work we did, which is the culmination of these ten years of struggling and failing again and again in trying to make patterns on the ten nanometer scale that is not just bad graphing. Uh, and the, I was reminded by Bjarke and Lene that four or five years ago, four years ago, or maybe five years ago, I think I was telling them, let's not do this anymore. This is hopeless. And they, they just, you know, convinced me that we should, uh, we should continue. So if they listened to the professor, maybe uh, this paper would not have been uh, um, real, but it is. And the point is what, what they did, what that they took, took the step further in trying to further optimize this etching through BN. So this is BN with graphene in between lying on silicon dioxide. Uh, and what normally is done is that you carve down like this all the way to the bottom with uh, an oxygen containing uh, CHF3H. That is the typical uh, way to do it. And what happens is, what we think is happening is you get back sputtering from the reactive nine etching. And also you have over etching of the graphene because if, this is graphene sheet here is etched all the time while you're etching down through the boron nitride. So you're etching the graphene uh, for more time than you need. And what, when we did this, we get uh, this type of result. So we were not able to, to get a, a, a regular pattern on a small enough scale. So what uh, Lena and Bjarke did was to uh, remove the oxygen. And when that happens, the edge becomes 100% uh, selective, which means that the SF6 stops dead on the graphene sheet. It's a single atom edge stop. With a reaction ion etching, that's quite nice. It doesn't work always, but most of the time. And then we can just, with a brief oxygen edge, we can remove the graphene sheet. So we call this a, a mezzanine, a mezzanine edge. It only goes to the graphene and then remove that. When you do that, you get much better quality of the edges. So that's a really nice trick and we're using that all the time now and also getting lower contact resistances by etching in this way. So thank you, Lean and Bjarke. All right, anyway, so the device we made was a hall bar where this area is not patterned and this one is. And when we look at the, here, you can see a schematic of the situation with the edge contact and boron nitride and graphene in between. And over here, we have these holes that has a pitch of 35 nanometer and a separation from edge to edge by 12 to 15 nanometer, which is uh, unparalleled in literature, uh, except for block copolymer lithography, where smaller patterns have been made, but uh, block copolymer lithography, uh, I am convinced, is just um, generating bad graphene on this. You have boron nitride protection there. So really the key thing here is not so important how you do the lithography, it just has to be super good, but the key thing is to have the boron nitride protection there. Now I'll show you what happens when we do. For instead of having this, this is smaller and smaller features. And when we go to get below 100 nanometer, then we see that our attempts and also other attempts in literature, the mobility is terrible. So you, you basically follow this line until you get to 100 nanometer in the feature size, and then it just goes through the floor. But our, our work we're using this method, using this new edge, was three orders of magnitude better than, than the, the kind of the common results that we saw in literature and that we have gotten ourselves. So for us, three orders of magnitude improvement, which means that after patterning with this crazy density, we still have a mobility of 800 square centimeter per volt second, which is extremely encouraging. So let's look at the uh, magnetotransport mission. I'm gonna skip this, I'm gonna, gonna I'm just gonna point out that if you have a healthy sample and you measure both change the gate voltage and the magnetic field, then you have a Landau fan that looks like this. So this is more or less showing that things are normal. It's a good quality sample, everything is great. Uh, so the first thing we did was to measure the normal end of the sample and achieving a result like this. So we have a Landau fan that looks pretty normal. There are some strange things going on here. I'll return to that in a second. But the thing is that really was exciting was this area where we have made the nanopatterns. And here we see something different. And we took a long while 
before we called up the theorists and asked, please help us with this because we have no clue. Because now we see suddenly that the Landau levels are, are curved and also that you have some kind of low uh, conductivity region that narrows into a line here. So many features here we didn't understand. Actually, after a while it occurred to us, oh, we were, we were actually chasing the band gap and that's a, that looks a bit like a band gap. It looks like there's an area uh, around the charge and charge point where the conductivity is very low. And this band gap is exactly corresponding to what we could calculate uh, was the expected band gap. So this is completely different from this situation. Here you have the Landau levels are spreading out, so the spacing between the energy levels is becoming larger as you increase the magnetic field of the y-axis. Here it's the opposite. The magnetic field or the, the gap is closing the magnetic field. So uh, fortunately we had some good theorists and we asked them, please calculate uh, what, what it should look like. And they did ensemble averaging of the, of the type binding uh, calculation. So they took many different patterns with slightly different edge disorder. When you increase, increase the edge disorder, so this is the measurement, so it didn't look very <laughs> convincing to begin with. And when you add a little bit of edge disorder corresponding to roughly one nanometer or so, you see that now the type binding and the measurement lay line off perfectly. And there are no feeding parameters here. This is, this is just zero fit, just perfect match. And this is unreal for me as an experimentalist. I always have to figure out some fudging parameters or something. So this is uh, very rarely that it works so well. And also, to just to be sure, they did another calculation using an analytical model, so the Iraq equation uh, uh, with a continuous graphene uh, with mass terms. So it's a completely different type style of calculation where they have a mass term that is non-zero mass term to uh, model the holes. And uh, that led to uh, this result. So something that is looks enough like the tight binding so that we started to believe that this is actually, we actually have an agreement between the behavior on a graphene that has been patterned on the 10 nanometer scale with theory. So last few minutes, we had some surprises coming. This was relating to uh, the Moiré effects, which means that when you put two sheets of two, 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 two periodic structures together and you rotate them, or if there's a lattice mismatch, you get a kind of a super lattice. So this is a, a why you should not have a striped shirt on the television because then the, the beating of the lines in the TV and your on your on your shirt will, will uh, create this sort of a, a sort of a DCing pattern. But in, in, in solid state physics, it is a, some, one of the most new and fun and groundbreaking things that has happened uh, in decades, in my opinion. And we didn't go for this, but accidentally the samples that we fabricated uh, 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 had some of these features. Just to remind you of this result uh, from 2018, which is the most cited paper in nature from 18, right? So it's pretty impressive, but it's, it's, it's by far the most cited paper in, in nature, so really made a splash. So it turns out that if you take two sheets of graphene and rotate them, you can get um, mod insulation and superconductivity uh, you know, just with two pieces of graphene. So this is an astonishing result. And right now you see like hundreds and if not, I don't know if we are at thousands of papers on Twistronics coming out. This is a bit older story. This is graphene against BN. And you can see these two groundbreaking papers from 2013 showed that the super lattice you get between graphene and boron nitride uh, also changes the rules for the direct fermions. So these electron waves, they respond to any kind of periodic structures that you impose on them. So if, you, if these uh, 2D materials uh, create some kind of uh, uh, variations in the, in the potential that is periodic, the, it, it changes the properties of the direct fermions. And that is helping us to explain these features here, which first was very confusing for us. The thing is that you see this, curve, this structure here is actually a clone of this structure. And we were wondering a bit what that is because we couldn't see it outright. It, as it turns out, this, the strange thing is that even after we have done, done the patterning, this one is still persisting. So we didn't dare to think it had to do with the Moray structure. We didn't know what it was, but we knew that even after we had done the patterning on this extremely small scale, this feature somehow still survived. And to, as it turns out, this is also a clone of this uh, direct clone. 
So this is one of the strange things that happens when you impose this super lattice. So this is what, what the papers in 2013 was about. They were about the cloning of direct uh, fermions and uh, also uh, hoofstetter butterfly stuff like that, uh, showing that the super lattice is, is giving rise to some strange type of uh, breeding of the direct cones, that, so that suddenly you see direct cones all over the place and you end up with a very complicated uh, energy uh, band structure. So this is a band gap engineering um, using super lattices and accidentally the sample had this kind of low angle. So that's why we saw this. We didn't go for it, but it was just something that happens uh, on air by accident. And we could see there are two clones and this, this, the, the position on the gate voltage axis is corresponding to the size. This is well described in literature. And we measured the position here and looked at the, uh, at the um, Moray pattern and could find like there are these two unit cells for the super lattice that both that matches exactly the positions of these two. And what we think is happening is one of them is killed. So the, the, the number two here is killed because it has a bigger wavelength. It has a bigger periodicity. And when you start to you know, you impose these holes that we carved in the graphene, they are being killed by the other one seems to survive. This is really strange for us to understand that we can do such a brutal patterning of the graphene and the moray effect, the effects inherited by the super lattice are still alive. Okay, and why we, so this is a, a I stole this article, I think from an uh, uh, article by Puna Morenko, uh, but it shows the, the sort of the cloning uh, principle. We have to have the, the direct clone sitting here, and then you have the clone up here, except this is our measurement. So we had a closer look at these two, and this is the final uh, thing that convinced us that, that this, is what, this was what happened, was when we zoom in on these two, we actually see something special. We see that they are identical. So, Remember, first we had an ordinary Landau fan that was copied out by the super lattice. Now it seems like we have done band, band gap engineering. So we have imposed our artificial lattice, our lithographic lattice. So we have the Moray super lattice and the lithographic lattice put together. And that generates a kind of a mix of these two effects. First off, we see the band gap. This is the band gap at zero field that is closing as you increase the magnetic field, just as I explained before. But that is now being carbon copied up to this position here. So instead of the Landau fan, you have our band engineered um, structure. So we think this is proof that it's possible to pattern graphene on the nanometer scale without murdering the more if super lattices. You would think they would be subtle and fragile, but even when we compare the, you know, the behavior uh, like the we like looking at the at the quantitative values in these two, we see that they are exactly the same. So it's re this is really a copy of this, or this is really a copy of this. Uh, so what we think that means is that we can do uh, more lattice engineering of the properties, and that does not prevent us from using other sorts of artificial patterns to augment this further or maybe make components. You can imagine maybe a squid with a, uh, with a, a superconducting bilayer graphene. We have proven that is possible, but we have shown, well, at least we have, we have shown there's a counter example of something similar that seems to work. So what we are hoping to do in the future is start to uh, examine this further to, to like to try to pattern uh, twisted bilayers uh, and see what would be the combined properties that we can achieve. Maybe we can make components and circuits utilizing these uh, uh, amazing effects. So graphene nanoelectronics on 10 nanometer scale is possible. It took us 10 years to get that far. And you can maybe even imagine twistronic circuits and devices being, um, being realized. So if not for applications, at least for the fundamental physics, uh, I think this is going to be a lot of fun to explore. With that, I'd like to thank particularly Bjarke, Lene, and Pousset, who, who, who was the uh, key players in the research I presented you, but also Mas Brandby and Tipeka Yahoo, the uh, and Thomas and Morten, the theorist that helps us to understand what goes on, and also Gaetano uh, Calogero. So um, I think that we thank you for the funding, and uh, we have lots of collaborators. I think 
I'm missing a lot here, but these are some of them. Um, and uh, there are some articles that you can have a look at. Uh, I can make the references available after the talk. Something questions. So, how bad was that? I went a little bit over time. Okay. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> but that's all. I don't have more. I don't have more. Uh, I, I think we all have your time. So. so, should we go to the questions of the last? So, can you achieve superconductivity by just patterning graphene? Uh, I don't know, but I don't think so. Uh, I don't think so. Um, does the survival of Moray pattern after brutal lithography indicate high interlayer coupling strength? Um, <clears throat> no, uh, the interlayer coupling strength is uh, not particularly uh, well. That means it depends on what you mean by coupling strength. If you're talking about the force, I mean the coupling, as in you know interfacial coupling. No, I mean I don't think the uh, there are some funny things going on with these twisted layers. <clears throat> Any of you who were at the talk yesterday and also <clears throat> have followed the literature, uh, know that the uh, twisted layers, they uh, relax, which means that uh, they, uh, for instance, if you take a twisted bilayer graphene, the AB stack stacking is much more stable than the AA stacking. I think the uh, AA stacking is even more unstable than topostratic. You know, uh, so so when it, so depend so because when you have a twisted uh, graphene, there are areas where the atoms are on top of each other and when they're not, and the sheets try to sort of make some stress in plane uh, motion in order to get AB uh, as much as possible to lower the total energy. So in that sense, you could say that uh, it does. Well, I say that these are weakly coupled. Uh, still, uh, these Van der Waals effects can cause some strange. Uh, strange uh, stresses uh, that uh, you maybe would not expect. Have you tried, have you planned to make a squid from graphene HBN more patterns? Well, uh, graphene HBN, Pablo, uh, does not give rise to superconductivity, so you cannot do that. I think that you would have, you would need a bilayer graphene, like two sheets of graphene, um, uh, to achieve that, um, the, uh, at least as far as I know. I don't think you can make get superconductivity from graphene and HBN. So if your question is whether I'm planning to make a squid from graphene, graphene, I think the, what we would try to do first is to learn to be good at making these um, twisted bilayers uh, on purpose. And that, that we, we are much behind the competition there because, uh, you know, groups that like a handful of groups who are, are so good at it that they can more or less uh, order or dial in um, a specific angle. Um, and make many samples that are high quality. So we are quite behind, but either we would like to try to pattern such twisted bilayer and examine the, the properties of low temperatures. But my, my honest guess is that I would like to do that, but probably somebody would beat us to that. Um, can you suggest a safe fabrication procedure to form sub-micrometer in-plane lateral heterostructures consisting in graphene? Uh, Alexander, so I'm not sure what you mean by safe. Uh, predictable or or like um, well, because the one with, we we did one experiment it was uh, led by um, uh, Professor Luca Camilli, who's now at uh, Rome, um, who we worked with the uh, Aarhus University using their fantastic STM facilities and showed that we could grow a hybrid like a uh, array of quantum graphene quantum dots in a uh, boron carbon nitrogen alloy so and that that we showed that uh, that was on iridium <laughs> so iridium is not like uh you know it's not an easy experiment to do you have to bake out the iridium for months to get the uh, really uh, sure that you, you get the predictable results so um there's a lot of literature on in-plane heterostructures what we did is probably not gonna be um a big hit because it's too too much work but uh, so if you want to make an in, a periodic in-plane heterostructure, that is difficult. That is what we did with a very complicated method. If you just want to make in-plane heterostructures, there's a lot of literature on how to do that. You can just change the, uh, the compounds uh, during the chemical vapor deposition. That is a typical thing you do. Another strategy is to make your graphene sheet and then uh, etch away some lines and then you regrow boron nitride, for instance. So that's a, it's a very interesting area. and, and uh, the, the difficult thing is to do self-assembled periodic lattices. And I think 
to my knowledge, we are the only ones who've done that, but it's not a method that I would recommend. It's a, it's just, well, it's a hard, it's hard work, but um, it can be done. So I'm curious to see if there's other ways to provoke a, in, in, in the synthesis to provoke a periodic lattice of two uh, dissimilar 2D materials. Maybe some here knows that it has already been done. To my knowledge, I haven't really seen it. So uh, um, I don't know if that answered your question. I hope so. <laughs> Peter, I, I have a question on my own. Yeah, no, Alessandro says yes, you did answer the question. <laughs> I, I have a question on my own, just putting the, the, the second and the third part together, of your talk together. Uh, what about trying to put water on, on, on this pattern, I guess? And oh, now, now you have edges all yes, around. The, yes, so. we so much would like to do that. That's really high on our wishing list to be. We didn't dare to, to play around. We had this sample that worked. Uh, I think at least that's how I remember it. And uh, we were like completely paranoid by, uh, by the thought of, uh, of, of, of losing it. So I think even if we had the opportunity to do the test on that sample, we wouldn't have done it. However, it's a very good idea. I mean, also, you know, uh, I'm just, I think it's a, I have been in multiple projects, big and small, trying to do molecular electronics and it's just, you know, it is so difficult to, to create the, the, you know, to create the systems and interface them. So you can, in a practical way, you can utilize molecular configuration for electronics. It's very difficult. It's horrible <laughs> doing so it's still like Never had any success with any of that. We try to make gaps of, and try to go to five nanometer gaps. And it's just very difficult. Anyway, accidentally, the system with the water at the edge, it is a molecular switch that is more or less surface sample because all you have to do is let in water and it's on. So it's another way of thinking about molecular electronics that it's not the molecule itself, it's an adsorbent that sits somewhere on a site that is accessible or preferable and that you, you, uh, you flip with an external uh, field of some sort. I think no, a lot of stuff has been done with, uh, you know, irradiation with light uh, to, to change the configuration of molecules. But I think it's really cool that you can take something as simple as a, 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 a polar molecule and use this dipole moment as to really impact the charge distribution, which we think is happening is that you are uh, essentially, um, because it's not a doping effect, but we think we're changing the, uh, the work function of the, of the system and certainly the, the charge distribution. It's difficult for us to understand how the effect can be so large. But, uh, if we can confirm this in, in also in smaller devices, I think it's a very cool way to have like a knob, to put a knob on something that doesn't already have a knob and then turn it with a field. That's very easy compared to what I, I've been involved in previously. Yeah. And very robust, as it seemed. So, <laughs> so we have, uh, we, we may have uh, also Stefan Roch, uh, who is uh, uh, at this site, at the VIP site uh, of, the, of the webinar, that may want to contribute with some questions. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Peter. It was really, really great talks and very, very interesting. Um, I have a question, but before, um, I have also some, some, some comments concerning to the, uh, the superconductivity in bioreographing that you comment. Um, yeah. As you know, the, this, uh, the, as you, you have mentioned that this has been really groundbreaking and, uh, and it can be observed for a, a very special uh, magic angle of 1.1 degree between the two layers and the origin is, uh, is due to the formation of very narrow bounds and people uh, believe that then this uh, generates uh, strong Coulomb interaction and etc. But it's, yeah. it's not very robust and, and, and at uh, 2 Kelvin it, it disappears already. However, what we have learned from that is that the fact that you are very now on very high level of confinement uh, at a certain uh, energy is, is uh, probably a good uh, guideline to, to go for uh, high superconductivity, high temperature superconductivity. So I'm wondering if, uh, uh, if you have envisioned to think about a patterning that could uh, uh, generate such kind of uh, highly confined uh, energy region. Hmm. I haven't thought of that. That's, uh, that's an interesting thought. So or uh, like we will, you could force some sort of uh, localization uh, exactly. by the patterning. Exactly. I imagine that 
that, I mean, what I would really like to try is to get my hands on a sample, maybe one that has already been tested, that exhibits superconductivity, you know, or, uh, and then pattern it. With, because the nice thing about the, the processes that Lean and Bianca develop, it's their post-processes. Mm -hmm. You can, you know, you have your device, it's already done, you have measured it, and then you can pattern it again and again in principle. Mm -hmm. That's already, you know, we're reusing samples. So samples that have been, have been carved into different samples. So th this whole procedure is, is very much ecological, organic, you know, uh, future, <laughs> re reusing the samples. Mm -hmm. Certainly, it's, it, but so we could take one of those samples that have already been measured and pattern it with our process and then uh, repeat the measurements. And that would maybe answer the question on whether you have uh whether you i know it's not a it's not the clean experiment you're suggesting you're suggesting to whether you can you know do that but i, I would expect some kind of in, that there's some kind of modulation of the localization effect by the yeah. fact that you have these you have these pocket the, the graphene islands that are connected you can see the the hexagonal lattice of graphene um in in several ways you can see it as these direct rings like the the semi classical orbiting uh, trajectories, which was an analytical model, but you can also see the, the, the graphene in between as like connected islands. So mm -hmm. it's a very good idea. Thank you. you. Yeah, yeah. You are, I think you have, a, you have a lot of room to play because uh, if, you, if you get a proper a pattern, maybe the patterning might be more complex geometrically speaking, but you have, a, you have developed a technique for that. But if you get a, pro a proper patterning that can uh, highly confine the electronic states, um, at given energies, then you have a much, a much stronger and stable, robust platforms for for in, uh, investigating uh, superconductivity. If, uh, if you would yes. produce, so that, that's what, that was one remark and some some uh, suggestion. My question, actually, uh, because uh, ev everybody. Um, uh, we are hearing every day about the virus that spoil our, our natural uh, our normal life, right? But when you have this uh, graphene, uh, um, antidote graphene lattices, actually you, you can size uh, the holes and uh, you can, if you, if you reach maybe under a nanometer, which is uh, the typical size of this coronavirus, I, think uh, I, I was big wondering big if you big could big filter, you could detect it, you could develop face masks, or have you envisioned to do something with your new material? That's not a bad idea because there's a lot of research going on about um, uh, uh, um, DNA sequencing, you know, and also protein analysis using nanopores and graphene. Now, obviously, we, 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 thought, we have thought about this and also I know there's this, anybody in the world who's punching holes in graphene are thinking about this as well because it's, 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 uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. So, but that's not easy, especially there are lots of, you know, to my knowledge, gaining DNA to transport through a graphene nanopore is doable, but actually the problem is that it goes too fast, as you know. But maybe a much simpler problem is to make some kind of filter or a counter. Uh, what would, so I imagine that would be, uh, I'm really out on, on deep water here, Stephen, so, but I imagine that, um, I wonder if you make a single pore, you could make, measure the passage of uh, coronavirus. The problem is it's pretty big. So it's even bigger than an HIV virus. I think it's 150 nanometer in diameter. And yeah. HIV is 80 nanometer. Um, and so, so the hole has to be pretty big. That means that everything would go through. Maybe the fact that it just fits the hole and it has exactly the same size. I mean, every single virus particle, as far as I know, has exactly the same size. So then maybe the fact that you know, know it's like it's the only one which is almost plugging the hole that that could lead to a signal that you could measure. That is a, as a, as a fun idea. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Take Thanks. care. Thank you. I wish when you, you asked me about the, the <laughs> coronavirus and antidote lettuces. I, I really was thinking, okay, what comes next? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm done. I'm done. I'm <laughs> thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Stefan. And I, I think that a, a question related to coronavirus is a must eh, for, for, for this uh, period and the webinars. So it's good that, that we finish like that. I have to thank uh, Peter again for this, this really nice uh, overview of uh, how to engineer electronic properties of, of graphene. I think that, I mean, my conclusion as we went through the talk is that the, the, the devil can be beaten, right? That, that this surface sensitivity can turn into, into a control knob if you, if you, if you use it cleverly as you did. 
So thanks for showing that and, and, and for the excellent talk. And thank you everyone also for, for, for attending the seminar. I, I hope that you all enjoyed the very good talk of Peter and that we meet soon in a, in a new webinar. Okay. Thank you. Thank so, you for the invitation. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.